we're talking about uh, whole, consequential threats to homeland security. So let me just talk you just briefly through the agenda that we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to cover a lot of material. There's a, there's, there, there's a real method to our madness, and we hope that will become apparent over time. Um, but, but for the purposes of our, our discussion today, each successive chart builds to create a picture of the contemporary homeland security threat environment in order to kind of do, in, do the following things. First, we're going to introduce to you our project and its place within a broader war college effort. Second, we're going to introduce you to the basic concepts we're using to launch our research and attack our unique charter and research problem. This is going to be all, again, described in the context of a much broader project on homeland security. Next, we're going to spend a little time demonstrating how past Army War College work laid a foundation for our understanding of the contemporary homeland security challenge as we see it now. Then we'll talk about the substance of our ongoing work, the, the emerging threat. Specifically, we'll identify specific threat actors, the focus of their future acts, the vectors by which they'll attack the United States, and finally, the broad effects that they hope to achieve by doing so. After we discuss all this material, I will wrap with the formal briefing. I'll wrap the formal briefing with a summary and some cleanup ideas for you all to consider as you think about asking us questions. Ultimately, we intend to have a very meaningful discussion with you on the concepts that we are still very much in the middle of exploring. This latter point in particular is very important to us. Our work will, our work will uh, eventually and ultimately be better because we spent this time with you uh, having a dialogue. So in the end, I, I hope that you'll ask very difficult questions of the material we're going to present and, and engage in with us in a two-way dialogue about, about the substance that we're, we're about to, to show to you. Um, stuck, just a second. I seem to be stuck. There we go. Uh, apologies for the for the tech. We seem to have a little bit of a delay in the change. So here's the here's the threat team's basic charge for the year. This is what we're here to talk to you about today as well. In a moment, I'll put our effort in the context of the larger Homeland Security project that we're contributing to. But for the time being, our team is in the midst of identifying and describing for senior U.S. officials the most important and dangerous purposeful threats to the U.S. homeland over the next decade. The Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as all others charged with Homeland Security, must look at what is commonly called the all hazards environment, floods, fires, hurricanes, terrorist attacks, et cetera. However, our specific mission is to single out and thoroughly ass assess those actors that would do the United States the gravest harm on purpose. As stated up front, we are not actually done with this work. We're, we're really in the middle. So what you're getting is an in-progress review of sorts. And you're getting what is, it, in effect, a snapshot of where we are now with this work and where we're going in the future. Ultimately, we hope to be complete with a written published report in the early summer. And our threat report will contribute to other materials published in the context of the much bigger project on Homeland Security that we're engaged in. As we've discussed, we're part of a much larger two-year effort sponsored by the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Guard Bureau. The larger effort is charged with looking into what future strategy for domestic national security emergencies should look like, especially those crises that emerge at home with origins in purposeful actors with intent to do harm to the United States. We have a small but very important piece of that effort. For reference on the next few charts, uh, our specific charge is highlighted in light red uh, across the chart. And you can see it here, pacing threat actors, threat vectors, and threat effects. The concept of national security emergency that's referenced in this chart is captured in US code and policy, and it covers the gamut of contingencies that include natural, physical, technological, and cyber-related crises. But it is also dated as, in, as new threat types are evolving 
in a rapidly transforming strategic environment. The bigger project will come to conclusions ultimately, and you can see in the blue clouds around this chart, on Homeland Security roles, missions, and authorities, strategy, concept, capability gaps, and the adaptations that the Department of Homeland Security's National Preparedness Framework, a framework that includes the concepts of prevent, protect, mitigate, respond, and recover, how they have to adapt in the context of the contemporary threat model that we are going to describe in the next few charts. So year one of the overall project is devoted to specifically to the issue of problem, what we would call problem framing. Naturally identifying and describing threat actors, threat vectors and threat effects goes a long way in framing the problem that the Department of Homeland Security and the entire Homeland Security ecosystem will have to confront. But again, recall, we're conducting this work within the context of a larger effort. And again, recall our very specific focus on actors, vector, vectors, and threat effects. In addition to our research team, their team's devoted to five other important lines of inquiry. You see them outlined here. History, policy and legislation, current strategies and plans, organizational constructs and information and intelligence. While all of these lines of inquiry are important, we like to believe that we're leading the pack by providing the effort with its external exogenous threat North Star. So what preceded and what I've described to you in the very long windup, and I apologize in a way for that, was, what, was materials that were intended to orient you specifically on what the threat team's work is and what, where we fit in a, in a larger context. Before turning over to my colleague, Andrew Wenzel, to begin our description of where the threat team work stands and is headed, I wanna provide a short history lesson on prior sponsor-focused Army War College work and how in many ways key elements of that work laid a conceptual foundation for where we are with the Homeland Security work we're undertaking today. We began sponsor-focused research at the U.S. Army War College in 2015 with reports beginning to emerge in the summer of 2016. Of late, a great deal of the work that I'm specifically involved in has been directly uh, related to and focused on the responsibilities of the United States Indo-Pacific Command and the Indo-Pacific region in general. However, we started our detailed sponsor-focused inquiries with important surveys of the strategic decision-making environment at the time and looking forward. The gray zone and risk work of 2015-2016 represented in the documents you see at the bottom of this chart labeled outplayed and at our own peril. And the ongoing work on the character of the US PRC rivalry starting in 2017, but continuing today, have been immensely instructive in context setting for us. In short, the US Army War College and the teams I've been involved with specifically have been on a campaign of learning since 2015, has been immensely instructive on the United States competitive position and its increasing vulnerabilities. We'll dis discuss the specifics of this foundational understanding that we've gained in a few moments. I'm now gonna turn over to my colleague, Andrew Wenzel, who's gonna begin to describe sort of the substance of the threat problem, and we'll proceed from there. We look forward actually in the end to your comments and questions, and I'll rejoin you in a bit uh, to discuss other aspects of our work. Andrew. Thank you, Nate. As a member of the research team, we've been working with professors from the Strategic Studies Institute, um, Professor Bert Tussing leading the overall National Security Emergency Strategy Project, and of course, Professor Fryer and our threat-focused component of the project. So they focused our research efforts and connected the team with the expansive network of national security professionals and academics. So our interviews with a number of diverse national security professionals has helped us to conceptualize the problem. So here you see the problem statement that Nate referenced earlier. And our research has focused on trying to identify the most consequential and purposeful threats that could constitute a national security emergency that threatens the homeland. 
We're excited to be with the Army War College Great Decisions today to share some of our insights and how we've worked to actualize the problem and some of the insights from the work so far. As our talk continues, we'll expand on each of the points you see in this slide here. And so one question is why now? What has changed? So our research suggests that US Homeland Security problems and vulnerabilities are born of a significant change in the environment. This environmental change makes the United States uniquely vulnerable to two pacing threat types, acting against the US along five vectors in the pursuit, in the pursuit of four principal effects. So more will be said on this. The key point I wanna emphasize here is that the United States is entering a period of substantial insecurity and vulnerability in the homeland. So with that, I'm gonna be followed by Vic who will discuss some of the ways we've been working to visualize and conceptualize this problem over. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. This is a broad model to visualize and think about the purposeful pacing threat to homeland security. We'll describe each component as we go through our brief. But as you can see, the threats here on the right-hand side and their capabilities, which can be used individually or in concert, essentially as a sinister cocktail of ingredients to affect the critical functions of the United States. Our next slide, please. So keeping in mind the Department of Homeland Security's most recent articulation of a national preparedness goal, we felt it important to identify the most consequential and dangerous threats for our study and for future strategic planning. We've labeled these threats as PACERS, which we'll continue to discuss in the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna pick up here and talk a little bit about the what we call the origins of threat and vulnerability. And this makes reference back to previous work that's been conducted by the Army War College and, and, and by teams I've been involved with specifically. 2016's gray zone work, again, uh, ending in the report in the lower left-hand corner of the chart you see here outplayed, yielded key insights into the United States competitive position and vulnerability. We at the US Army War College developed what we think is a parsimonious way of capturing the nature of contemporary resistance to and rivalry with the United States and US great power. The contemporary Homeland Security Challenge actually fits this, fits this model perfectly. It's not enough to describe gray zone challenges as competition below the threshold of armed conflict, which is what is commonly the case. After all, force and violence can be important components of gray zone resistance to the United States at home and abroad. Instead, it's important to focus on gray zones, three defining characteristics, hybridity, menace to convention, and risk confusion. I'm gonna deviate a little bit from script here just to talk about, talk about these. Hybridity really is this idea that Vic pointed out that increasingly rivals to the United States to include domestic threats that, that we're gonna talk about, um, create these hybrid cocktails of hostile acts that ultimately have warlike effects on the United States, on its authority, its institutions, its norms, and its critical functions. Menace to convention means that though these acts are warlike, uh, gray zone challenges are nonetheless so unconventional as to de defy traditional national security solutions. This includes in many cases, especially as it relates to sort of domestic challenges, the law enforcement solutions. And then finally, risk confusion is this idea that when confronting a gray zone challenge, the hazards associated with action and the hazards associated with inaction appear to be equally bad and unpalatable. Inaction or paralysis is often the default choice among senior decision makers because inaction actually, though, though having sort of adverse downstream effects actually is deferred hazard. The hazard doesn't come up until later and therefore uh, many, in, in many cases, senior leadership uh, can, can think about actually dealing with the problem down the road. It's because of these three characteristics, a gray zone approach is work. Um, and I think that the, home, the, the contemporary Homeland Security threat actor is skillfully leveraging all of these to get at uh, decisive effects against the United States. 
So some additional background on the origins of U.S. vulnerability. Again, making reference to past work that has been done at the U.S. Army War College. In 2017, a report entitled At Our Own Peril, you see it uh, um, here on the, on the right-hand side of the chart nearer to the, the column uh, that references it. Um, 2017's work in, on enterprise-level DOD risk yielded the idea that the United States had entered a period of post-primacy. Now, post-primacy doesn't necessarily mean that the United States has been defeated or is lost, but what it does mean is that the United States was going to have to work harder and smarter to defend itself and its interests. Now, post-primacy, from our perspective, followed three other prior eras uh, in sort of the post-World War II period. After World War II, you had, you had the period of the Cold War that led, you know, up to 1989 to 1991 when we had the end of the Cold War. You entered the post-Cold War period, which sort of went from the 1989-91 time frame to 2001. And then you had, you had the post-9-11 time period that went from 2001 until we entered what we believe to be this post primacy environment. I can't tell you the exact date that it started but I can say that the post-primacy environment, um, we, we, really, we, we sort of picked up on this trend by recognizing five principal characteristics of it. One, hyperconnectivity. Everybody's connected by their phone, their computer. Um, electronic connectivity in particular is prolific, and it has led to the weaponization of information, disinformation, and sort of disaffection amongst uh, constituent populations, not only abroad, but also in the United States. Then you had the rapid fracturing of the post-Cold War status quo. This is sort of has been manifested of late, even in the United States, where nation states in particular sort of pursue their own interests uh, first, as opposed to the collective interests of any alliance structure they might be in or any uh, bilateral agreement they may have entered into with another nation. But the primacy of you know, individual state interest over collective um, security interests increasingly became apparent. And, and with that also actually, um, and I'm gonna go a little bit out of order, came this resurgent but transformed great power competition. In particular, um, you saw the increased sort of gray zone, application of gray zone power by the People's Republic of China and the Russians against the United States in ways that delimit U.S. influence around the world, bound the United States to a certain extent, sort of curtail U.S. freedom of action and ultimately attempt to actually uh, replace the United States as the actor of most consequence in particular regions of the world. Um, also, you had the proliferation and diversification atomization of effective resistance to the United States. And what we mean by that really is that um, it, the, the, the cost of entering into what would be consequential uh, competition with U.S. power became became lower. This is in large, you know, in large measure uh, reference point one on this sort of hyperconnectivity and the weaponization of information certainly led to an increase in the effectiveness of actors at increasingly lower levels to cause great trouble for the United States in securing its interests. And then finally, you had a disruptive or sometimes violent disillusion of political cohesion and identity. You're actually starting to see that manifest as well a little bit inside the United States, which makes us particularly vulnerable. Post-primacy, our, our view of post-primacy sort of evolved um, in looking specifically at the great power problem in particular, namely the Russians and the Chinese. We, start, we started to actually define the, the circumstances that we were operating in as hypercompetition. We call hypercompetition a persistent struggle to gain, exploit, and maintain transient advantage across and within highly contested domains and competitive spaces. If you believe, as we argue, that post primacy doesn't mean defeat, but it means that the United States needs to work uh, harder and smarter in order to achieve its objectives. The hyper-competitive environment as it relates to great power rivals like Russia and China is a manifestation of that particular post-primacy environment. The bottom line to all of this is that the barriers to meaningful competition 
with and resistance to the United States and its once very formidable national security tools uh, are increasingly lower. So I'm going to pass on to Katie, uh, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what makes a pacer and why we use the term pacing challenge. Katie? Thanks, Nate. So we decided with our uh, study that we really had to kind of put parameters or bounds on the problems that we were going to focus on. We couldn't think of um, every single problem that the US could face. So what we decided to focus on is what we call pacing threats. Um, the term paper, pacer has been used uh, in IR before, so it's a familiar term. And the way that we're using it is um, uh, directed at this quote, it's called, uh, or it says, making the most progress toward plausibly contesting the United States in a particularly worrisome way. And that's by Sean Brimley. And uh, that is kind of the essence of the threats that we are looking at. That is what makes a pacing threat to us. And for the uh, context of the study, we are looking at pacing threats to Homeland Security, which we identify as individuals, groups, movements, or states who have demonstrated the intent, will, and this is important, the capability for purposeful catastrophic acts or catastrophic campaigns against US authorities, institutions, norms, and critical functions. Uh, later on, we will be getting into what those critical functions are. And then for the next slide, I will be talking about what constitutes a catastrophic campaign. Um, the big picture is that PACERs are the worst case scenario uh, for people involved in strategy and strategic planning for the US. These are kind of the um, biggest problems to focus on. Next slide. So mm -hmm. what is a catastrophic act? So for us, a catastrophic act is purposeful, disruptive, destructive, damaging or lethal activities that are perpetrated by our threat actors um, that are capable of triggering cascading failure within or across one or more six critical function areas. So our six critical function areas, and there are more, but for the purposes of this study, this is what we narrowed it down to. This is what we are focusing on. It's govern, manage, inform, connect, supply, and distribute. And again, this will be explained further later in the presentation. But we got the term catastrophic um, actor campaign from US code. So this is already a familiar term, just like pacing threat was. And we wanted to look at what can trigger cat cascading failure, which means the failure within the system or network um, that hazards the results in more generalized failure across interconnected or interdependent systems or networks. So we are looking for the events that can be dominoes that can trigger a failure in one area to a failure in another area to a failure in another. So we really want to look at things that constitute catastrophic uh, failure for us. Next slide. Great. Thanks a lot, Katie. That that was excellent. So to just focus in a little bit on on the critical function areas, let me explain those because I think it's it's really important. Uh, to understand that. And again, if, if I were to portray this differently, I think I would portray this as, uh, and we do later, as you'll see in the mental map, we portray these as, as, uh, as a Venn diagram, as highly interconnected and interdependent functions that are uh, reliant on one another for the stable and secure functioning of each. So um, uh, if I were to portray this on this chart differently, it would probably be as a Venn diagram. So DHS uh, uses the term critical function to identify vital activities and systems upon which to use constitutional terms, the general welfare and common defense of the United States and its people rely. That's our using the language, not necessarily the Department of Homeland Security using that language. The critical infrastructure, uh, the cyber and infrastructure and critical infrastructure security agency identifies 55 individual national critical functions that fall beneath four categories, manage, connect, distribute, and supply. We've expanded uh, that agency's four categories to six and have relabeled them critical functional areas so as to separate them from current 
official U.S. government policy because we want to make that distinction uh, and, and ensure that people don't confuse the fact that these are not necessarily in exactly as stated in U.S. policy, but we've actually taken some license and liberty with the concept to expand them in a way that we think is more reflective of contemporary vulnerability and risk. Um, we've ex again, we've expanded to six. You see the six portrayed here on this chart. Um, the, those that are uh, colored in green, uh, manage, connect, supply, distribute, are the original four um, promulgated by the Department of Homeland Security. Those two that are reflected in red are, the, are what we have interpreted as increasingly important to break out or parse out from, uh, from the four. And so we've created this list of six as opposed to four. And the whole list of six, again, is govern, manage, inform, connect, supply, and distribute. You can see the, the descriptions of those here, govern, make, administer, enforce government policy, and civil and criminal law at the various levels of government, manage, organize, and administer the provision of essential public goods, services, and commercial activity. Inform uh, is providing reliable, uh, reliable and widely accessible data information and news for the effective for effective decision making and choice um, in both the public and private sectors. Uh, enable is enabling, or I mean, sorry, connect is enabling critical communications and the secure exchange transfer management and storage of essential public and private sector data and information supplies meeting public and private sector demand for the provision of essential goods. And then, of course, distribute is meeting supply uh, by leveraging uh, networks, infrastructure, and tools necessary to satisfy uh, the demand that, that we describe in, in supply. So um, as Katie described the relationship, as Katie described above, the relationship between these critical function areas, their interdependence, and their interconnection creates the prospect for cascading failure within and between them. We suggest this is increasingly important to understand. This is increasingly uh, important to understand. And it's, it's important to understand in, in, in the following four ways. One, uh, what are the vulnerabilities of these uh, critical function areas? Um, two, uh, who are the threat actors likely to exploit that vulnerability? Three, what are the vectors by which those threat actors will attack or act or attack against the critical function areas. And then finally, four, uh, I'm sorry, uh, four, the effects that may come from the attack. And then, and then a, a, finally, a final and broad consideration is the strategic approach necessary by, uh, by the Department of Homeland Security and those actually responsible more broadly for Homeland Security at the various levels of government to meet the national preparedness goal that was described earlier in the in the briefing in light of these actors, vectors, and effects. So I will turn over to Vic, who's going to talk about our threat actor types. Thanks, Nate. Uh, again, the two facing threat actor types we've identified are individually or in combination capable of catastrophic acts or campaigns. And just to highlight, so these power, these uh, pacers, uh, first are great power rivals, namely Russia and China and network domestic extremists. Uh, Russia is a declining power, but appears to be the most immediate and comprehensive threat, described as a rogue, not a peer. And China is a rising power who is more cautious, a peer, not a rogue. Network domestic extremists, or NDE, are actively pursuing illegitimate forcible change to illegal authorities. They are aggrieved, hyper-connected, seditious, and capably armed. These are not, however, people or organizations who are engaged in legitimate protest, civil disturbance, or even disorder in response to social injustices, or who are petitioning for government reform. Next slide. Yeah, thanks, Vic. I'm going to pause for a second here and actually make a couple of key points that I think are important for everybody to understand. Number one, um, the, the, there's an, there's, uh, first, there is increasing consensus in the security community about the rising threat 
of that latter category, uh, network domestic extremists. But we want to be we want to be very clear that uh, first of all, I would I would say, and I was thinking a lot about this today uh, before we gave this briefing. The first thing I would say about it is it is it is a threat that is just now rising to the level of um, a, a grave potential for harm. And I, I say that because um, largely because of the, the, those things I outlined about post-primacy, right? Hi, Hyper-connectivity and the proliferation of disinformation and, um, and, and leveraging and weaponizing disaffection. Uh, all of those things are kind of coming together um, in a perfect storm now in ways that allow this network domestic extremist actor to really rise in prominence in how we think about the problem. Um, but the other thing that's really important is this is a really high bar. Um, the, the idea that we identify a, the, the, that we use the term pacing threat um, does not mean that we have captured every threat, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, or jihadists are not still a threat um, or that middle powers like North Korea or the Iranians are not still a threat. What we're trying to actually get across here is there are threats that um, have the potential to do us harm and there are threats that have the potential to do us harm in a way that causes cascading failure of authority, institutions, norms, and critical functions. And we have sort of for the purposes of this work, gone all in on defining what those are, because those over time will be the most important for US national security leadership to, to understand. Um, and then finally, you, I think it's important to actually note that um, both of these threat actors, again, as Vic said, either individually or in combination, are clearly, clearly have the potential based on our research to cause this kind of catastrophic or cascading failure uh, of the kinds of functions that we all rely on for our stable and secure um, and pros prosperity. Homeland security. So I'm moving on now to talk about pacing threat actor types and the nexus between the, the foreign and domestic threats. So, um, so uh, I'm only there's a uh, there's 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 clearly a nexus between the foreign and domestic threat. In the past, and I, I actually have talked about this quite frequently about uh, with others. Uh, that you know, I started my I started my journey in the national security world as a terrorism guy, and so it was always largely focused on terrorist the terrorist threat uh, abroad. Um, increasingly, again, sort of going back to these um, characteristics of post primacy and the concept of hyper competition, increasingly there is great potential for a foreign and domestic nexus. So, so a, for, a, a foreign or domestic nexus, a foreign domestic nexus may occur either by accident, design, or opportunity. The likeliest manifestations uh, of threats emerging uh, of a foreign domestic nexus emerge from great power rivals and NDE acting in in some form of combination, uh, network domestic extremists and foreign extremists combining their actions or effects. In other words, there are going to be uh, non-state actors, uh, both inside the United States and abroad that share some kind of common ideology or goals. And as a result of this, find common cause and can act together. And finally, all three actors, great power rivals, network domestic extremists and foreign extremists again, acting in some kind of combination. I think it's important to understand that there are, there are different ways that this nexus occurs. It can either be collective action, coordinated action, complementary action, or opportunistic action. Um, and you can see in the yellow box at the bottom, maybe presented a little bit out of order, what each of those mean. But collective action means there's some kind of standing alliance, right? Two, two, act, two or more actors get together for a common purpose and, and tightly work together um, in collective action uh, toward, a, uh, toward a common end. Uh, coordinated means they get together on a specific issue. Hey, we're really mad about one thing. 
we want to get together on that one thing and we want to move out and we want to take action together just based on this one specific issue, but we don't have broad, similar broad interests. You might actually think about coordinated sort of as a, a marriage of convenience. Um, uh, complementary is independent actions taken by one or more, I mean, two or more actors uh, toward a shared or common goal, but, but, but completely uncoordinated. It might even be incidental, meaning that they take these actions against the United States in particular. They take these actions uh, with zero coordination between uh, each other, but, but nonetheless, the actions themselves are actually mutually supportive, right? Um, and, and, and help out the other. And then finally, opportunistic action is bandwagoning, right? Um, we use the January 6th event uh, as a potential example of how a foreign actor could have bandwagoned very easily on uh, sort of a disturbance inside the United States, right? So seeing the opportunity where the United States is having some internal challenge, um, it would be very easy then for a foreign actor, either through the information sphere or physical spheres, to jump in on the action and create even more chaos and, and, and challenge as a result of that. Um, then finally, I want to talk about this, this and I, I took this back from Vic just because of this final point. The foreign domestic nexus might emerge from middle powers, again, Iran, North Korea, uh, or others, acting with or through or in conjunction with network domestic extremists. Again, we have to be prepared for the opportunistic action um, uh, occurring as a result of this as well. So I'm going to turn over to uh, uh, my colleague, Andrew, who's going to talk about uh, the vectors. Thank, thank you, Nate. So our, our research so far has led us to categorize the vectors by which pacing threats seek to harm the homeland into five threat vector categories. So these threat vectors capture the means and methods by which adversaries threaten the security of the homeland. So the first, resources and economics. Through this vector, adversaries go after the prosperity and the systems that contribute to our prosperity and the perception of that prosperity. So this can include the weaponization of capital markets, supply chain disruptions of key components, um, investing to develop control interests in tangible assets that have economic roles and even dual uses like ports that could hold the homeland at risk. In the next category in the red box, um, cognitive, social, and civic. This vector is a cognitive battlefield. The battle seeks to alter perception, judgment, and reasoning regarding what it means to be a citizen and what it means to relate to each other in our social environment, and thereby um, potential to undermine social cohesion and the legitimacy of authority. Next, the cyber and electromagnetic spectrum is the two core global environments and supporting systems that connect all people and critical functions. So we have a fast changing environment in this arena. Through this vector, adversaries can attack national critical functions in ways not possible in previous generations and our vulnerability continues to grow as our connected world grows. You'll see that those are in red and um, the meaning for that is that many of the experts we're talking to say we are already um, in conflict in these vectors. So we're actively in contact, conflict in these vectors. And now we'll go on with a brief description of the, the next two. So physical force and violence is that actual or even just a threat of grave physical harm to life, property, or systems. This vector is when adversaries can use to cause CAD cascading effects by itself, or the psychological impacts can bleed over into the other vectors like the cognitive, social, civic, cyber EMS, attacks to critical, key critical infrastructure nodes or symbolic of impacts are just a few ways that they might manifest themselves. Of note, this vector is short of the use of weapons of mass destruction, which is in the next and final vector, the Seaburn one. So Seaburn, both weapons and the weaponization of materials, mass destruction, this vector constitutes a significant escalation um, that threat actors might use and will create psychological impacts as well. So for example, a threat actor just even threatening to use medical products and a dirty bomb can cause impacts in the cognitive, social, and civic sector. So there are relationships here where actors can hold the 
multiply the impacts. And um, with that, I think um, Nate wanted to add something here. So I'll turn it over to Nate. Yeah, so I just want to, the, the thing that's most important, I think, in all of these is I want to take this all the way back to our discussion at Gray Zone at the beginning of the conversation. In the end, you can see how, especially, you know, using the red box as an example, you can see how sort of the use of disinformation and a, di and, and a disruption in cyberspace or the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, really affecting our ability to communicate with each other um, can actually become like a, a, a multiplying uh, a, a multiplying event or a cascading event, right? Similarly, uh, and we have some, you know, we haven't presented, you know, sort of the specifics like uh, the connection to the, the, how the Nashville bombing um, recently affected um, emergency, emergency communications by, you know, police forces, 911 calls, cell phone service, uh, network access, or I mean, network or internet access. Um, so, so you can see how like the individually actions can be taken that, 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 that ultimately become sort of weapons or weaponization of the other vectors. Um, and, and I think that uh, what we've actually uncovered as we, as we look at the way that Homeland Security authorities think about this stuff is, um, they, they, they're trying very hard to, to, to shove everything in the Homeland Security space into this idea of physical, natural, cyber, or technological. And so hurricanes and floods and all that goes into the same basket as Russian disinformation or, you know, uh, consequential economic attack on the United States using the commercial sector um, or even, you know, physical violence taken by a domestic actor, you know, a, a campaign of physical violence undertaken by a domestic actor for a specific purpose. What we've tried to do with these five pacing threat vectors is basically say to those who are most worried about the actor, the, 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 the types of nations or groups individuals or movements that may want to purposefully harm the United States, we argue that you can bin virtually all of their activity in one of these five categories and that you have to, like the critical functions, understand the relationship that exists or the potential relationship that exists between these five categories individually and collectively. So I'm gonna talk very quickly now about pacing threat effects. Um, and, and we're about to wrap up. I know we've given you a lot of material, but we're about to wrap up. So pacing threat effects. So we've gone through uh, threat actors, uh, threat vectors, uh, the critical function areas against which they're gonna attack, and now the effects that they want to achieve inside the United States um, by their catastrophic action campaign. So we have four categories of threat effects. We've debated these quite a bit internally on our team, but we've settled on these. Um, and the, the four threat effects are co-opt, corrode, coerce, and cripple. Now we've used words, I think, that are common, right? And there is, I will be honest with you, the, having four C's is, is, is useful in communicating this concept, especially if you're having to give the elevator speech to a, to a national security or homeland security official and trying to tell them how an actor is gonna attempt to actually get at the critical functions by doing by by having one of these four effects so co-opt is really the uh, inspiration uh enlistment or exploitation of action by others who are who share common opponents interests or objectives okay and this could be witting or unwitting co-option right but the the point is to divide arrival exploit division and then conquer according to that exploitation Corrosion, quite simply, is is to, to put it to put it uh, in very simple terms, is to destroy from the inside out, right? And this vector preys principally on fissures or divisions, bias, grievance, contested legitimacy, and popular uncertainty and doubt, 
and attempts to actually pervert, discredit, devalue, and degrade uh, or dissolve authority, institutions, norms, and functions. It's literally working from the inside out um, to, uh, to, to, to sow division and to create, uh, to create vulnerability um, without it actually being sort of an obvious external attack. Course is simply to attack somebody's risk tolerance, right? To affect favorable change by making a rival either stop what they're doing or uh, to, to A, not undertake an activity, B, stop their activity because of some threat of cost, or C, once they've undertaken that activity, turn that activity back or defeat it um, by again, exacting high cost. Dissuasion is, is using the United States as an example. If, a, if an opponent of the United States wants to dissuade the United States, they're simply telling the United States, you are not in a, in a particular market or area. Do not go in there or you'll suffer the following costs. Deterrence is, we know you're in that market or area or, or business, but do not go any further or we'll exact high costs on you. And defeat is, even though you're in that market and that you're operating and that you're moving and that you're creating opportunity for yourself, I'm going to actually... I'm going to actually work directly or indirectly against that and force you to change your course because the cost is simply too high. And then finally, cripple is to paralyze and then exploit paralysis, right? And so crippling is targeting, targeting an opponent's means of effective prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. To cripple in the end, to put it quite simply, is to force an opponent, in this case, if you're a rival of the United States, to force the United States to focus exclusively on recovering from an, an attack actor campaign first before they can even think about effective counteraction against the action that you've taken. So to, that, that, that's sort of the ultimate end is to cripple, cripple. Um, and crippling can be kind of a, it can be a decisive blow. And, and we, we can certainly talk about multiple ways that we see that unfolding over time. So in the end, any any of these individually or in combination can result in cascading failure of authority, institutions, norms, and critical functions across the board. Finally, we're going to just take a quick review of this chart again. On the, on the right-hand side of this chart, you see the pacing threats, Russia, network domestic extremists, and the PRC, and China down at the bottom. I think what's really important to understand is the threat vectors, again, going across resources and economics, the cognitive, social, civic vector, the cyber EMS vector, physical force and violence, and then finally the chem, bio, radiological, and nuclear vector. N these should be these would be better portrayed as a rope that can be knotted together and pushed in one direction, or that one, uh, two or more of these could be knotted together and pushed in a direction, but they shouldn't be seen necessarily as individual activities. For example, Andrew quite rightly pointed out that we're seeing a lot of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of combined activity in what we're now calling the cognitive, social, civic, and the cyber EMS as, as, as sort of a combined action. The other thing I want to point out is that corrode, coerce, and cripple, um, uh, the, the, the four C's, co-op, corrode, coerce, cripple. The one thing that you need to know about co-op is co-op can be a tool by which you corrode, coerce, and cripple, as well as an effect in and of itself. And therefore it's kind of portrayed, you know, in a different way on this chart than the other three are, precisely because co-op is cross-cutting. You can get, you can, you can identify and leverage proxies to corrode. You can identify and leverage proxies to coerce. And you can identify and leverage proxies to cripple an opponent. And then as I stated before, one thing that's very important about the critical functions that's the blue circle you see all the way on the left is that all of them sit on the, all of the critical functions sit on a platform of governance, right? So there are laws, policy, regulations, et cetera, that sort of manage all the critical functions inside the United States. And so all the critical functions sit on that foundation and all of them rely intrinsically on the connect function. So there, the ability of us to connect 
on sort of an interpersonal level as well as on a machine level and everything in between um, is exactly what sort of makes the United States continue to tick. And so if you're looking for clear vulnerabilities uh, that can cause cascading failure, perhaps the one place that you can have the greatest effect is in the, is it, is in the connect function. And again, let me just sort of uh, final, finally end with this chart, which we started with, understand that the United States Homeland Security Challenge is, is effectively a gray zone challenge. It, it manifests in hybridity, a menace to convention, and, it, and risk confusion, right? Hybridity is a cocktail, of, a cocktail combination of threat uh, methods and capabilities. A menace convention means that there's no good answer. There's no good traditional answer in either the national security, military, law enforcement realm for the kind of problem that you're facing. And risk confusion means that the, the uh, hazards associated with action and inaction tend to, be, tend to appear to be equally high and unpalatable to the decision maker. Um, again, the Homeland Security Challenge is accelerated and largely enabled by this idea of post-primacy and hyper-competition. We believe that the United States is uniquely vulnerable to catastrophic actor campaigns perpetrated by those two pacing threat actor types we talked about, great power rivals and network domestic extremists. Um, again, understanding what is a catastrophic act is, it is something that is so disruptive, destructive, damaging, or lethal that it may trigger widespread cascading failure across those six critical function areas we articulated earlier. And then how will threat actors try and achieve that end? Well, they'll do it according to those five vectors, resources and economics, the cognitive, social, and civic, cyberspace, the electromagnetic spectrum, physical force and violence, and of course, C, uh, CBRN. Um, and then finally, um, uh, what are threat actors attempting to achieve by doing this? They're attempting to co-opt, corrode, coerce, or cripple their opponent. So with that, I'm going to pause. I'm going to put my camera back on, and we're more than willing to accept questions. Thank you very much.